got you there with Sean Delaney. Got- I'm Sean Delaney, and today on What Got You There, I sit down with Harvard-trained behavioral scientist Zoe Chance, all about the powers of influence, how we can all learn to become more influential both to ourselves and others, so we can create true, lasting impact in the world. Got you there with Sean Delaney. Got you there. Uh, got you there with Sean Delaney. Zoe, welcome to What Got You There. How are you doing today? I'm doing fantastic, Sean. Thank you so, so much. Absolutely. Glad to be here. Yeah, no, it's really good to see you. One of the things that that I admire about you, and I'm always impressed by, is just the presence you bring to everything you're doing in terms of presenting your presence on stage. And I'm just wondering, are there things you do leading up to an interview like this or a talk you give just so that you are in a great state? <laughs> Thank you so much. I absolutely do. And music is my go-to to get myself pumped up. I don't know if you use music too before a talk. So for me this morning before our talk, I wanted to get in the zone and be feeling good and pumped and relaxed. And so I listened to the song Bella Ciao, which is the theme song for Money Heist, which is just this incredible Spanish show. And it, it the show itself is so exciting. And the song is an Italian folk song that's an it's the anth- it's an anti-fascist anthem from the 1940s. And I just love singing this song and getting myself ready to go. No, I, I always love hearing about like those little things going on behind the scenes. Like everyone gets to see you do a great presentation, but they don't understand some of those little rituals and little things you do just before. So I think that's really cool. I, I would love to know though, because um, because you're great about like understanding how humans work, but I'm I'm also sure you understand yourself really well. And I'm wondering, is there a mindset of yours that if you could just pass on to everyone, you would love everyone to take on with them? Yeah, Sean, there really is. And And nobody has asked me about this ever, but this mindset that I find it it explains at least 40% of my happiness is the ability to have vicarious happiness for other people's success. So it not only strips away almost all of the potential jealousy, I still get little streaks of it sometimes, we'll keep it real, but it gives me an infinite capacity for happiness because you can only have a certain number of good things and amazing things happen in your own life no matter how great it is and if you get to be happy about other people's success then there's there's just no limit so i am happy for other people every single day and so i can't really have ultimately a bad day unless there's like a tragedy I'm so glad you brought light on this because I feel like this is one of those things that very few t- people talk about. Um, I, I know like people talk about gratitude a lot. And one of the things I do love about gratitude is like you can't be in that state of sadness or jealousy if you're expressing gratitude. And this, your practice, you expand that out even further. And it's just so cool to see because it's helping you, but then also like that positivity going towards other, I'm sure it's even unlocking and inspiring them even more along the way. So it's just yeah. great to, to hear about people really focusing on that. Was there something that happened that all of a sudden you realized this and it started coming out more? Are you just naturally one of those people who are are really obsessed with other people thriving and doing well? It's totally just from my mom. Hmm. (laughs) My mom is like that. And so just growing up with her, she just gets so excited. And it's not this, this peaceful happiness. It's just enthusiastic joy for other people having good things happen. And so I, I must have just gotten that from her and modeled it from her. And I feel very blessed to have this because so many people in the world have been trained not to brag. And so we don't share our successes. So a lot of the good things that happen are kept private. Mm-hmm. And yeah, there's Facebook and humble bragging and all those kinds of things. But I get to be someone for so many of the people in my life and, you know, friends, family, students, some people that I don't even know that well, I've taught them in a workshop and they will just, they'll reach back, let me know about their good news. And that like, I love it when people brag to me about the good things that are going on. And the, the people we can do that with are like me and your parents. <laughs> and so- It's a really privileged role that I get to have. Oh, that's fantastic. One of the things that you mentioned is just kind of like different experiences. I know you picked this up from your mom. I feel like you've had a really unique set of experiences that really have like shaped this 
unique individual who's incredibly smart, but then you've been involved in so many different things. And I'm wondering if we were just kind of like looking at different chapters of your life, even like certain decades, how you title those chapters? Holy mackerel. So I'm one of those people like you who has been obsessed with self-development and personal growth, like <laughs> growth junkie. And, and for me, it's intentional and unintentional. So I think I'm a different person every five years. Hmm. Um, and that's also led to the demise of two marriages. But my current husband <laughs> is on a similar growth path as I am. So I think it's going to work. But when I was when I was very young, I was so, 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 so shy. And I was so, 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 so nerdy that I had this theory that the reason that people talked over me and didn't listen when I spoke was that my voice was the same timbre as the ambient sounds of the universe. So that gives you an idea of how nerdy I was. Um, so that we'll just call those like <laughs> the quiet years, the nerd years never ended, but I was, and I still am quiet, but that was like beyond the beyond quiet. Um, and then I had in like, this was like, high school and college, I rejected all of that. And I wanted to have friends and I definitely tried to reject the nerdiness. So I in 10th grade, didn't read a book all year because I thought that was cool. And I was scared of not being invited to things that were happening. So I started planning social events all the time. And I was the person planning outings and parties and things like that. So I realized like, you can't not be invited if you're the host. And so we'll just call those um, the, <laughs> let's call them the party planning years. And then, and I was learning about people, right? And then I had a big period of time where I was doing sales and marketing as a practitioner, and I was obsessed with influence, but it was in a very selfish transactional sort of way. So we could call those we could call that the transactional period. And then academia, I, I didn't care enough about selling things. I was selling Barbie dolls and we were selling two Barbie dolls a second. And it was like, well, what does success look like? Is it selling three Barbie dolls per second? And already girls were getting five Barbie dolls a year and they're going into a landfill. And I was like, well, if I sell them six Barbie dolls a year, is that even a good thing? <laughs> Does it even matter? And so I came to academia and those were like the like exponential nerd years of just learning how this all works. And now I would say I'm in a phase of my life where um, I'm in contribution mode and it feels amazing to be at this phase where I'm not worried about what's coming or not coming to me because I have just total confidence that there's going to be plenty, like I'm just going to be fine. And so I can focus on what can I bring to other people? And I feel absolutely blessed about that. In, in terms of that final, that abundant stage, like how does that come out? Is that like, you just have to live through so many of those experiences or do you think that could actually get sped up where you can get to that state of wanting to give back and being abundant even earlier? I'm sure that someone besides me could have gotten to that stage even earlier. And when I look at many of my students, so I teach in an MBA program and there's students from across the university who come, but they're primarily people in their late twenties and as a generational thing. And then my daughter is in her teens. So as a generational thing, there are many, many, many more people in Gen Y and Gen Z than in my generation, Gen X, who are demanding meaning from their work. And this is a big part of what's going on in this great resignation right now, right? That, that people are saying a paycheck is not enough for me. Of course I need a paycheck. You have to pay me, but you can't pay me enough to sell my soul. Like I'm not going to prostitute myself for dollars. And I think I had some fear. I grew up poor and that gave me some fear about financial stability that probably kept me in a fearful state of um, being self-focused for longer than I needed to be. I'm wondering, like, what was the major turning point for you where the comfort set in, right? Like with clarity comes confidence, I feel like. 
where you are able to feel more at ease and comfortable with your authentic self and allow that to shine through. Like I'm even thinking about the course at, at Yale. Like what, what's great about that is you created the course that only Zoe could teach, right? Like you designed that specifically. And I'm wondering how that evolution occurred for you. Um, this was definitely a service mindset where I had done an MBA. So did an MBA at the University of Southern California thinking I was going to go be an entrepreneur. And then I met all these entrepreneurs who were so unhappy. And I know that people listening to the podcast, many of you are entrepreneurs and I have all kinds of admiration for you because I just couldn't be you. My husband is a social entrepreneur. I couldn't hack it because of all of the work and all of the uncertainty. And so I said, I, I can't deal with entrepreneurship and I'm just going to take a corporate job. So that was when I took a job at Barbie Mattel working in Barbie marketing. And um, I had done also sales. I worked in door to door sales and telemarketing, not glamorous sales, but I learned a lot and I had worked on political campaigns and I had done a lot of theater and movies, not a lot of movies, but some. And when I came to Yale to teach, I just asked myself, what is the best that I can offer? What's the best I can offer of myself and my knowledge and my experience practically? And then my training and research in behavioral science and behavioral economics. And I decided I just wanted to invent this course based on everything that I knew to help MBA students and anyone else who wanted to join to do the thing that I could help them most with, which was to become a more influential person. And I had through that trajectory somehow learned to become a person that a lot of people really want to say yes to. Mm -hmm. And it's an incredible blessing. And it's also taken a lot of conscious effort because of growing up so nerdy, as I told you, many people are born blessed with the ability to like, you know, charisma up the wazoo and charm and, and privilege maybe also that has them feeling more entitled and more comfortable with advocating for themselves and also just a ridiculous charm. But I didn't have any of that. And so I had to learn what does it take and I had to practice. And that makes me better equipped than someone for whom it came naturally to teach other people what it takes to get there. Zoe, I, I know you're so thoughtful. And like you mentioned a minute ago, you, you put conscious effort towards these things. I'm, I'm wondering, is there anything you do now that you think helps get you further along your own practice and your own process? Is there any little routines, habits you do that bring more of you out? Yeah, I'll share with you a weird one. I love the weird one. So this is great. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, so nobody else does this because it's it's just something that I invented and it's not something that I teach. <laughs> so it's, it's just so far been for me, but I have this journal that I write in before I write when I'm working on, when I was working on the book or at papers, anything that I'm writing. And this practice is called my Nietzsche journal and Nietzsche's philosophy. It's so nerdy, right? But Nietzsche's philosophy is that the purpose of being human is to become someone who does not deny and my part of my research background is I've done a lot of research on self-deception. So I'm keenly interested in and keenly aware of the degree to which we deceive ourselves by just not seeing things that we don't want to see. And so, so for me, the process of stripping that away is becoming someone who does not deny. And my Nietzsche journal is just one or two pages that I sit down and scribble out stream of consciousness before I write. And every line begins, I do not deny, I do not deny, I do not deny. And what comes out are good things, shameful things, exciting things, fearful things, um, all the stuff that's crowding and clouding my mind so that I can have a clear mind when I start writing. Is that the first thing you do in the morning? I'm thinking of like the, the um, creative practice of morning pages, which is just three pages, just nonstop free hand flowing. Is it the same similar practice, just using that prompt instead? For me, it, it helps to do it immediately before I'm writing my other thing, okay. because that's the moment of truth when I yeah. need to have a clear brain. Hmm. So if I did it right, when I wake up in the morning, my brain is clouded again yeah. by the time I sit down to write. 
<laughs> I know exactly what you mean. You mentioned self-deception. I know you've done a ton of work around this and I, I want to hit on some self-deception and even a little bit more around decision-making, but I would love to know, like, if there was just some like aha for you around self-deception, which you discovered through your research where most people aren't aware of just how deceptive we are to ourselves. Is there anything like that you'd want to share? One of the interesting studies that I did that I haven't published because it just didn't fit into a paper, but, um, but I was intrigued about is when you ask people about what they deceive themselves about, and you ask people about what other people deceives themselves about, we tend to say that we're deceiving ourselves about romantic things more than anything else. That's almost the only domain in which we notice we have self-deception going on because self-deception is really, it's not something you can perceive in the moment, right? Because you're deceived, <laughs> but we think in hindsight, damn, I didn't realize and, and it's always going to be something bad about the other person, not about ourselves. Like, oh, there were these red flags at the beginning of the relationship that were there. And in hindsight, I see them, but I was deceiving myself because this person was hot or I was in love or whatever it was. But when we ask somebody what your close friend, what do they de deceive themselves about? It's usually about their competence and they're overconfident and they think that they're better than they actually are. And we're like, yeah, no, 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 no. You're not as smart as you think. You're not as hot as you think. You're not as good as you think. But we never see those kinds of things in ourselves. So I'm wondering for you, a researcher, when you when you come across a finding like that, what what do you do, right? Like, how do we even make that actionable and and start to realize the, these other ways we're deceiving ourselves? So I think it's it definitely just helps me have some humility yeah, right. to know, <laughs> like, I'm definitely worse than I think that I am, and I'm not gonna perceive those flaws that other people are perceiving. And so I can ask advice about things that I want to improve. And instead of just asking like, okay, what's wrong with me? Cause nobody who cares about you wants to answer that question, asking questions like, okay, on this specific thing, um, how can I do better? Or like, here's a list. Like I love working with executives and I've done this some with myself as well. The list that Marshall Goldsmith ha has in his book, what got you here won't get you there. And he has 20 or 25 things that are specific things that leader specific mistakes that leaders make that they don't really realize are mistakes. And they might even think that it helped them on the path, but if they keep doing them, it's a, it's career limiting. And mine, one of my big ones, for example, when you give this list to other people, so it doesn't help that much to introspect you might see some, but you give the list to other people and you're like, hey, on this list, can you pick one for me? And that's easier to give feedback on than just like, hey, Sean, so what do you think is wrong with me? And you'll be like, oh, I think you're great, right? But if I give you a list and say like, hey, Sean, out of this list, I know I'm great. I know you love me, but but to help me be do even better at my job, what's one of these? So the feedback that I have gotten is that I add too much value. So I have a lot of, I have a lot of ideas and a lot of enthusiasm. I love it when the people ask me for advice, you know, and you can tell you're like, Hey, what? And I'm like, Oh, blah, 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 all this stuff. But to help other people be successful, mostly the advice needs to come from them, especially if it's a specific situation that they're working on. So if you come to me and ask for, ask me for advice on your specific situation, I need to acknowledge this is something that you're asking me for advice on because you've already been thinking about it. Yeah. You probably already have better advice for yourself than I do. And if I tell you something that you've already thought of, then I'm just undermining your enthusiasm mm -hmm. because it doesn't feel like you get to get credit for this good idea. Then I'm taking credit for your good idea. So if you come to me and you ask me for advice on your specific situation, I will remind myself to say, well, tell me what, tell me about what you're thinking about. And instead of saying, well, here's an idea, I might say, well, um, so tell me what you've thought about in this particular domain. And if 
I, I, so I'm not at this ninja level, but when I get to the ninja level of inception, like that, was it a Matt Damon movie? Um, no, it was Leo DiCaprio, I think. Yeah. DiCaprio was in it. Yeah. So where I have some idea, but instead of me giving you the idea, then I'm seeding the idea in your mind and it pops up and you feel like it's yours. Like that's like triple quadruple black belt level. Uh, I'm just smiling because it's so funny, right? Like we, we seek those masters because we're looking for that. Like, Hey, here's the simple answer, right? Like social media does this all the time, but like the best teachers and mentors in my life, they, they've gotten me further because they've posed in my mind, better questions. It's like, we want better answers in life. We got to ask ourselves better questions. And it, I, I know you bring that to light a lot in the book. And one of the things that, that you write about in the book is changing people's minds and like it doesn't necessarily influence their behavior, which is always like our goal, right? And we think if we change someone's mind, their behavior is automatically going to be influenced and changed. And I'm wondering why that's not the case. It's like we have a new epiphany, minds change. Why don't we act on it? Especially now, it's like the new year. Why isn't our behavior changing? Yeah, this. Is, so we're you and I are talking right now on January 6th and half of the world has just made a new year's resolution and half of them have already failed it. Yeah. I, and, and almost all of the rest of us are going to fail it by the end of the month. The changing somebody's mind, let's just start with when it's already successfully happening. And then we'll talk about how it's actually almost impossible. But when you've successfully changed somebody's mind or when you've made up your mind about something that has almost nothing to do with whether you're actually going to follow through on those intentions, because motivation and process are just completely decoupled. The biggest obstacle to us following through on our good intentions is just ease. Ease is the best predictor of behavior. And it's a stronger predictor of behavior than motivation or satisfaction, price, quality, intentions. What really, really matters is how easy something is or how much effort we have to put in. And so if you are changing somebody's mind, but it hasn't gotten any easier for them to do that thing that you want them to do, it's likely that their behavior won't follow. And um, we can see this in examples like the five a day campaign to get people to eat more fruits and vegetables has been, as far as I know, still the most expensive public health marketing campaign that had anything to do with nutrition. And it was radically successful by their own metrics and replicated in, I think, 32 countries around the world because they were just looking at awareness. They were measuring awareness when they started in 1990. Only 8% of people knew that they should eat five fruits and vegetables a day. And by 1995, it had quadrupled and 32% of people knew that they should eat five fruits and vegetables a day. But if you looked at behavior, it was 11% in 1990 and 11% in 1995. It did absolutely nothing. And then during the later part of the decade, it declined. So this, and they, the campaign had cost in those years $250 million. This was a colossal waste of money but a perfect example of changing minds that didn't do anything to change behavior. And if you think of, so you're a healthy guy, so I'm sure you eat plenty of vegetables, but when you think about it, it's not actually easy to eat vegetables, right? It takes effort at all stages, <laughs> planning, preparation, shopping, all of this. And, and then it also takes resisting temptation when you open up the fridge or the cupboard, you're hungry and you see something else. So it, you, and let me ask you, okay, you do eat lots of vegetables, right? I'm just guessing. Correct. Yes. Okay. What do you do? Like what practices have you put in place to make it less effortful for you to eat vegetables? Gotcha. Great. Yeah. Thinking on my feet here. So this for me is a multi-decade practice where it started with like vision, right? So play to lead sports, professional sports. So like my drivers, like I literally, I, I want to be the best in the world. So like, what do I have to do? So like, for me, it was so much easier resisting certain things, but I also realized how flawed I am. So to get to your point, the path of least resistance, right? Like if you were to look in my fridge, I do not have all of these tem tempting things that would take me away from selecting a vegetable. So for me, it's like, I've, I've cultivated my environment and it's lucky, like my wife's the same, like our kids, we, we eat similar. So I don't have all of these temptations. So like two things, right? Like path of least resistance, like I just said, 
But then also like, I, I generally, I want to be like vibrant. I want to be fulfilled. I want to like be able to attack life. And I just feel different if I don't eat that way. So for me, it's like a no brainer. It's not even, I, I'm not making a choice every time I go to eat. Like it's just part of my identity. So there's no decision to be made. Um, there's probably more than you, than you needed there, but just no, like it's no, it's exactly perfect and helpful. So the two things being part of your identity, when we're able to make a transition like that, to internalize some decision as I'm, I'm just not a person who does that. I'm a person who doesn't do that. Then it actually becomes easy. And that's super, super rare. Um, and I've talked to people, for example, who go from smoking to non-smoking by internalizing the identity of I'm a non-smoker. Now yes, and a, a non-smoker just wouldn't do that. Yeah. Like if someone offers you a cigarette that you see here, plenty of people be like, uh, no, I, I wouldn't want one. Other people like, no, I don't smoke. And there's a clear yeah. difference there. It's the difference between identity and then having to make that decision every time. Yeah. And what you're talking about, about the, the path of least resistance is, well, of course you're going to eat healthy food because it's impossible for you not to. <laughs> yeah. And, and that is exactly how most healthy eating people have organized their lives. It's not just what you said. It, they're not resisting temptations. So a lot of us who resist temptations and we have things that call to us in the fridge or the freezer, or the wine cellar, whatever it is, we don't understand how does somebody resist it. And the fact is they don't, hmm. they don't, they don't have the temptation around. And that's what makes it easy. We're talking about food and actually getting people to change the behavior. I would love for you just to illuminate what you did with Google um, in terms of shaping how they eat. Cause I think this is just so fascinating and just shows like the impact you're able to have. So I worked with Google for years in um, a consulting project with the food team that expanded to the center for customer insights at Yale with other faculty and other students. And um, I created this partnership with Michelle Hatzis at Google and she's now left Google and I've left the project and it continues it's been a very fruitful partnership. So, so many things that we've worked on, but um, some of those include eating, encouraging people to eat hated vegetables and um, discouraging people from snacking. So here's an example and a bunch of other ones to um, eat more sustainably, reuse water bottles, things like that. But one of the ones that had to do with mindless snacking, that's so, so simple to implement in your own house, that's exactly related to what you just said, is that we had research, research assistants go in and just spy on people in a break room where there were two coffee beverage centers and there was a snack area that was closer to one of them. And all they were doing is noting how many people took a snack if they went to the one beverage station and how many people took a snack if they went to the other beverage station. And, and then we interviewed people to say, why did you go to one beverage station or the other? And it had nothing to do with the snacks. It 50% more people were taking a snack if it was close by and it's in your field of vision. And so you're not planning to take a snack, but it's there and you grab it. And this was such, this wasn't even an intervention. It was just an observational study with over a thousand people. But it was so powerful that when we presented these results to Google, some a team member from the architecture firm that was working on, with them on their food areas immediately during the conference after this presentation calls back to headquarters and says, listen, we need to redesign all of the corporate break rooms that we're making for all of our clients so that we don't have drinks and snacks in the same area. This is a no brainer. What I love so much about this is uh, I'm fascinated with like system design and how structure creates behavior. And so like you'll see the same or different people entered in the same environment. And you'd think that, oh, these are the high performers. They're completely different. No, it's like the structure. So you said these little changes. I just love that. Just like these little subtle things can influence behavior so much. I, I know when we were talking about the, the different decade chapters, you, you mentioned getting intrigued by influence. Like what was it for you that really drew you into influence? And then like now this is becoming your life's work. I guess, um, after theater, which I was just really excited about, and it was lots of fun and taught me to connect with people emotionally, I became really curious about influence when in college I started working in sales. And my first job in sales was door-to-door -door sales, where it's so cringeworthy on all sides. And I know 
everyone hates door-to-door salespeople, but I'm telling you, door-to-door salespeople are also cringing when they start this job and, and continually because it's so uncomfortable to interrupt you. You're eating your dinner and they're coming to try to sell you something and ask you for your money. And uh, and I was in college and I needed some money and there's a lot of money in sales. So I took this job and was absolutely terrified. And I just thought that I was going to die <laughs> <laughs> going and ask, interrupting strangers to ask for their money. And what I learned was how kind and warm people are and how much more patient and tolerant and friendly they are and how much it depends far more how you ask for something than what it is that you're asking for. And so when I, I got to learn from this practice that just approaching people with warmth and enthusiasm and kindness and a good sense of humor meant that nobody's almost nobody's slamming the door in my face. A surprising number of people are buying that. I was selling discount dry cleaning books in this random job (laughs) and, and plenty of people buy them. Plenty of people don't buy them, but that it's a comfortable conversation either way when you approach someone as a human being rather than a means to your ends. Mm. And so that got me curious to study more. And I read Cialdini's book, Influence, which I absolutely loved. And that was a big influence on me stepping out of the corporate world and joining academia to study this stuff and do the kind of research that Bob Cialdini was doing. Yeah, you, you mentioned Professor Cialdini. We've been lucky enough to have him on. So we'll have that linked up here in the transcript. But you mentioned the how instead of the what. And I'm wondering, just because I know you've mm-hmm. done so many research projects, are there any concrete examples of how people can see that play out in the real world? So when you say see that, what could you say again? I didn't quite follow. Yeah, yeah. Just in terms of you, you mentioned there's such a difference in terms of how you oh, ask oh. something as opposed to what specifically you're at. And I'm just wondering what that looks like. Um, I, I'll share a misperception that That a lot of people have that is really hurting a lot of people. And it's explaining, I believe a significant part of the gender wage gap, which is that women are believing that because they get judged sometimes and there's backlash sometimes around negotiating and advocating for themselves. And we can talk more in detail about this if you want, but women believe that they shouldn't ask for too much. And there are plenty of men who believe this too, but it's just more pervasive with women. So we believe that we shouldn't ask for too much. And so lots of us are trying not to ask for more than we think we deserve or more than we think that we'll get. And so we ask far less often, and we ask for far less than men do. But the reality is that when women, not just in lab studies, but large scale real world field studies of labor markets, when women ask for as much as men do, they get paid as much as men do. So there's no question that it's not how much you're asking for that's making people uncomfortable with you, that there is there is a backlash against women who are perceived as selfish or entitled or greedy or not warm. That's just, it's more common for women to experience that than for men to experience that. Um, and then there's also, unfortunately, the <laughs> sort of double whammy of women being more uncomfortable negotiating, especially for themselves. And when we're uncomfortable, that comes out more. And when we're uncomfortable and we're needy and we're scared and we're asking for something, that neediness has this repulsive edge to it. So this is why I am absolutely passionate about just helping people get practice. So that when you're in that high stakes situation, like negotiating a job, you've gotten a lot of practice, you've gotten rejections, you've had successes so that you don't have that like "Eh," feeling that makes people want to say no. Yeah. I was going through the book. I made like a private note on just like pushing back on resistance. Cause I think this is like a superpower. Um, and you had a line I have right here. So it's, but I learned how to ask for things and how to survive when people said, no, I learned how to get curious about resistance instead of pushing back. I think like, that's just like one small little line, but so important, right? Like instead of pushing back on that resistance, like 
How do you get open? How do you get curious? I thought that was just a super superpower. And I would love if you could even just like illuminate more on the thought process behind that. Yes. And it's interesting that you're asking about that because you've been super successful in the world of sales. And absolutely, I'm 100% sure that you had to master that to be as successful as you were in that role. Yeah, I'd agree with that. Yeah. Okay. (laughs) So, so people like you are some of the only people on the planet who understand and practice that. And that's what distinguishes a successful master salesperson from the rest of us and also from unsuccessful salespeople. And so for people who are listening, who are not in sales, a lot of A lot of people, a lot of nice people, a lot of my favorite people hate the idea of working in sales and it feels cringy to them because they don't want to be aggressive, manipulative, or like those sleazy, smarmy kind of salespeople that all of us have interacted with at some point in time. But those are not the master salespeople. Those are not the most successful salespeople. The most successful salespeople are people who, when you're interacting with them, it doesn't feel like a sales conversation. It just feels like a conversation. And instead of pushing you and giving you something to resist, they're stepping back, opening up so that you feel inclined to step in. And When we reject someone, when we say no, or when we criticize or express some discomfort, we're always anticipating that that person will resist us because that's been most of our experience. So when we say no to somebody or express some concern or objection or whatever that is, we're expecting that they're going to be defensive. And so it's a master level Aikido move to say something like, so tell me more about that or help me, help me understand or what I think I'm hearing you say is this and, and to have that openness is just, it's disarming and it's very hard to resist somebody who has so little, so little pressure against us. We feel ourselves leaning in. Hmm. You mentioned a minute ago, just in terms of so many people perceive sales as cringeworthy. And a lot of people have the exact same feeling towards influence, right? Like this is just yeah. this highly manipulative thing. And I love you, you and I are on the same page in terms of how you view influ- influence and the importance. I would love for you just to shed light how you think about influence and how it can have this positive impact. Yeah, At, absolutely. Similar cringe work, cringiness about influence. And I think it's partly because of social media influencers um, that a lot of us are annoyed by. But when we reject influence or influence tactics or influence techniques, we are leaving power to the power hungry because influence Mm -hmm. ultimately is power. And it's not that I believe influence is a good thing. I don't. I also don't believe it's a bad thing. It's power like electricity. And you can turn on the lights in your house or you could power an electric chair. So it's something that I believe all of us have a responsibility to cultivate an understanding and a knowledge of and learn how to practice it because that's the only way that we can get things done in the world that we want to get done. And of course, I want to empower people who have good intentions more than bad intentions, but actually power hungry people are already studying influence and they've read every other book. (laughs) And the way that I've written this book is so that it will be palatable to people who haven't sought out all of those other books and people who wouldn't find it um, pleasant or comfortable or wouldn't even be willing to use some of those very heavy handed, like hard sales techniques, things like that, which I don't like them either. Yeah, I wouldn't use them. And, and they're not successful in the long run. It's just only in the very short term transaction that they can work. Yeah. One of, one of the cool things that you write about is just the impact this can have for the students at your course, the Mastering Influence and Persuasion course at Yale. And you, you talk about some of the difficult conversations they have even around like the dinner table or with distant families whose relationships have been lost. Um, so I know, I know the, the listeners can, can read further in that, but I'm wondering for you, what are the biggest ahas for your students that after they leave the course, they're like, wow, this, this foundationally changed me and, and how I view things. Is there anything like that just comes to mind for you? Yeah. And I'll share the thing that is um, really boring and obvious <laughs> because this is the truth. And so what students get out of the course 
is what I expect readers will most get out of the book that you'll think you shouldn't have to take a course or read a book for, but it's really to just ask. And it's so obvious and it's just one sentence and, you know, I can tell you just ask, you're like, okay, I kind of knew that already. Um, I didn't need somebody with a Harvard PhD to tell me this, but it's the practice. And what happens when we start practicing asking more often is that all of a sudden it's like this veil is lifted from our eyes and we realize how much we haven't been asking and all of the opportunities that have passed us by leading until this moment where there were so many things we could have asked for so many people we could have asked things from but we were playing small because we didn't want to be greedy or manipulative or to in inconvenience someone. And when we start practicing asking and we do it in a warm and genuine and good humored way, we realize people are happy for us to ask. The world is happy for us to ask and they don't have to say yes all the time, but being someone who is willing to ask is the most life-changing shift that you can make. And for all the entrepreneurs who are listening, this is absolutely the thing. And the book will teach you tons of other practical, specific types of things. And, you know, you'll find the one thing that's the most important for you. Um, but asking is just the fundamentally most important thing for everyone. And we don't know how much we're not doing it until we start practicing it more intentionally. Zoe, that's the key there, right? Like you, you mentioned, it's so obvious and I have to agree. I, I feel like I'm someone who has kind of built up that muscle of asking. I, I was revisiting that chapter this morning and it, like, it was just like, you know what, Sean, you're actually, you're not that good at that. And you missed so many opportunities and there were so many better ways you could have structured this. So I found just tremendous value in that. So I, I, I don't know, you just say like, it was so obvious and I'm like, I feel like you just went so many layers deeper where it was so actionable. Um, and I, I just appreciate that when, when you can take a book, you can take a specific chapter that really unlocks you or opens up certain things. So yeah, any entrepreneur out there or anyone in general, I really do think there's tremendous value in that. And then one of the other things that I'm always really intrigued by, and I know you've studied previously and even wrote a lot about is just our subconscious mind and the impact. So I would love just like starting like high level understanding from you, how you think about the influence and the impact our subconscious mind has on us when we all think we're, we're rational human beings and making all these conscious decisions. Yeah. So for listeners who might have done some reading in behavioral economics, this is going to be related to what you have heard of as system one and system two. And for if that's not familiar, it doesn't matter. You don't need to memorize those names. But the idea that I find to be the fundamentally most important idea in influences from behavioral economics. And as you just said, Sean, it's about how our subconscious mind is vastly, vastly more powerful than our conscious mind in determining our behavior. But because it's unconscious, we're not perceiving it. We think of ourselves as being these conscious, rational people making deliberate decisions. And then we project that on other people as well. But that's just the tip of the iceberg. The, the proportion of influence these two systems have can't be measured. It, it would be impossible. But researchers who study this estimate that it's maybe 95% of our behavior is driven by the unconscious system. This is our gut reactions, visceral responses, um, quick judgments, and habits, anything that we've done through practice eventually becomes habitual and we're not even thinking about it. So when we're trying to influence someone else, it's more important that we think about how to influence the unconscious mind and gut reactions, emotional responses, and mindless habits than making the best persuasive case with the perfect argument and facts and data. That's also important, but in within the interplay of these two systems, it's super important that the unconscious reaction happens first. It's fast, it's instantaneous, it's always the first responder. And then the conscious reaction is the second guesser. And it's only sometimes, and it's only if we have enough bandwidth and if our mind thinks that this is a sufficiently important situation for us to use our limited conscious resources. And in the book, I go, I, so for 
nerds. And even if you already know about these two systems, I go deeply into the interplay between them and we don't need to get all that complicated. But what happens is the unconscious mind is influencing the conscious mind a lot and not vice versa. And so the conscious mind thinks that we're making these objective, rational decisions, but we're doing a lot more rationalizing the desires and preferences and opinions and assumptions that our unconscious mind has. Oh, I, I love that. Do you have any examples? Cause I, I know just like your work within marketing, any brands that you feel like have really tapped into this and understood this and then influence our behavior basically at a subconscious level here. Um, it's funny because what good brands don't do it, mm. right? Like yeah. this is, this is something that consumer marketing and advertising has understood for a long time that we just haven't mapped on to leadership. So television advertising, when you look at which television ads are more effective, so a market research study looked at 1400 ads to say, was this a, a campaign that was more appealing to the conscious rational part or the unconscious emotional part, or was it a mix? And they found that ads that appealed to the unconscious emotional part vastly more successful than ads that appealed to the rational part. And actually it didn't help to mix them. It was less helpful to try to do both things at the same time. And when you look at most television ads, they're trying to appeal to your emotions, many of them telling stories, right? And so this is not rocket science, cutting edge, aha, for consumer marketing. What the cut, the aha thing here is that as a human being, interacting with other human beings, your employees or your bosses, your friends, your family, your partner, your kids, actually, those people are just like consumers, where we need to consider their emotional reactions and their gut check immediate responses just as much as we do with the consumers. Mm. It's just that we don't want to use marketing techniques. We don't want to use consumer marketing techniques with those people that we care about. And so the book goes into a lot of other kinds of practices and strategies we can use with them. Yeah. You, you had some really good insights into that, which is just so important uh, for everyone. It doesn't matter if you're in a leadership position, because we're all essentially in certain leadership positions within our family, our teams, anything like that. I, I am curious though, just mentioning kind of the certain people who unlock you and have impact for you, who have been those biggest influences on you um, to really shape who you are today? Oh, I've mentioned already my mom <laughs> and I dedicated my book to her because she's been the biggest influence on me. I mentioned briefly, I grew up poor and she was a single mom and she was an art teacher and a summer camp director. And she was so fun. She was the funnest person I knew, and she embodied being someone that people want to say yes to. And I shared she has this vicarious joy for other people's success. And when I was little, she she ran this summer camp in the summers to make money when she wasn't teaching. And she would do things like that were just absolutely crazy. Like she would blindfold us put us in a car and then drop us off in the middle of nowhere with a compass and a topographical map and be like, okay, kids find your way back. And like, who does that kind of thing? Like when we would go on a treasure hunt, she would have had <laughs> like gone through the woods and hidden all of these puzzle pieces. And then you put the puzzle together and you get a map that takes you to a pond and she's buried a, a foot locker full of like gold painted fake jewelry and, you know, treats and stuff. That's like legit pirate's booty. She had, she had people so inspired counselors and collaborators and things that they're writing their own songs. So the camp has its own folk songs when it would, it rained when we were in a camp out and we had to build our own teepee for this camp out <laughs> and it rains. And she's like, okay, well let's, Oh no, no, no. It was the opposite, actually. I'm totally misremembering. There was no rain, but we've just built a teepee. And it's just my mom's spontaneous thought that we should do a rain dance to try to make it rain. And so 
she's having all of us make up this rain dance and song. And as we do the rain dance and song, it starts raining out of nowhere. There was not a cloud in the sky. So my mom brought this joy and this good influence and also this sense of magic to things in life that didn't, that weren't necessarily going to be fun. Like we'd have no money for ice cream because we, we lived in the one bedroom apartment. My sister and I shared the bedroom. My mom slept on the couch and um, even just having ice cream wasn't like something you could go and do. So she just say like, Hey, let's go on the bike trail and we'll walk down, walk on the trail and we'll look for change from the universe. And so we would just find change on the bike trail until we had enough money for ice cream. And then we would go buy it. So it's this level of um, quietly exuberant optimism that probably had the biggest effect on me was my mama. Zoe, thank you for sharing that. It, it makes me think of two things. First off, I have someone in my life, view them as a mentor and what they try to do is bring magic and delight into every interaction they have with someone else. And sounds that that's very much like your mom. But then yeah. I, I was coming across another bit of interesting research. Uh, I'm a parent to two kids. So I think, I think about that a lot, the relationship with them. And they, they did this research around what children remembered the most about their, their parents. And you think maybe it's they did this thing for them to get them in a certain school, something like that. And it was nothing like that. It was all these spontaneous interactions where these like joyful moments came out of nowhere. And it sounds like you've got these incredible memories because of what your mom was able to do. So I, I'm saying this out loud because I, I'm thinking now I'm like, all right, I'm going to go create a treasure map and me and my son, we're going to go look for it. And then <laughs> other people can do that as well. So I just appreciate you bring light onto that. That's I would all beautiful. I didn't know about that research. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll have to pull the specific study. I know you're obviously fascinated with the, the studies there and send it over your way. But I, I would also love to know your mom has such an impact. Were there any foundationally game changing books or things you've come across like that, that you go back to or just really shaped your thinking today? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm a nerd. And so um, books are pretty much my life. We've got the um, color coordinated bookshelf there. Uh, behind you. <laughs> you can see. Yes. Um, I would say one of, one of my absolute favorite books of all time was recommended to me by one of my students. Let me see if I have it easy to grab right here. I do one sec. Yeah. It's <laughs> this one. What is that? Love does it's, yeah, Love Does by Bob, Bob Goff. And this is the spiritual version of the, the message that I teach and preach. Bob Goff is deeply Christian. I'm not religious at all. There's a lot of Jesus in here, but as a non-religious person, I didn't find that um, uncomfortable at all. And he's writing about his adventures in audaciousness. Mm -hmm. And he does things like, th this is a chapter that I read to my daughter's third grade classroom when <laughs> she was in third grade, because it was so inspiring. And uh, every chapter is so inspiring. It's called The Interviews. And this was after 9-11. His kids were upset. And they said, what can we do? And they have a family conversation around the dinner table about how what can we do in the world right now? And the kids were just saying, I wish that the, I wish that leaders of countries would just talk with each other. And I wish that we could talk with them and just help everybody get along. And it's such a um, innocent, sweet, and like, you know, almost generic kid wish, right? Like, yeah, like some, whose kid wouldn't say something like that. But Bob Goff, because he's amazing, he's like, okay, well, let's reach out to them. And so they start writing letters. They write letters, his kids write letters to all of the leaders of all of the countries asking if they can come and meet with them and talk with them and be friends with them. And so like why this speaks to the just ask and we have no idea how likely people are to say yes. So that first nothing happens. And then they start getting back a couple of letters saying, you know, thank you, kind of busy, but appreciate your message. And then they start getting letters from people saying yes. And so they, Bob 
and his wife pause the work that they're doing and they go on an adventure with their kids and they go around the world meeting the world leaders who said yes to them. And they have adventures like showing up in Russia with a tea party, like spread of all the perfect pastries for the kids. They meet, they meet with every world leader that they meet with, they give them in a little box, the key to their house. They give them their house key and say, we would love to see you. You're, you're our real friend now. Please come back and visit us and you can come and stay anytime. And he doesn't say who it is that came and stayed with them after that. But they have, he creates this so transformative experience for his children, which is beyond even my mom. And, and he's created these beautiful moments of interaction for these world leaders who are super, super busy, but they love that these kids want to talk with them and they're hopeful about the world. And then he gets to share this with people in this book. And then I share this, I assign this chapter to my students to give them inspiration. And I just believe this guy is to me as inspiring as anyone else in the world for being audacious and kind and making huge, huge asks. Zoe, that was absolutely beautiful. Uh, I've not come across that book before, but one I'm certainly going to order today. That, that was probably one of the best answers I've, I've ever received about a, a book that's impacting someone. So thank you for sharing that. Oh, and then just thinking even about impact, you're having a tremendous impact, obviously with your work, but then you're even donating half the proceeds in, into something that's really meaningful for you. So I, I would love to just hear about this because I think it's so impactful. And I think this is really going to deeply resonate with a lot of people. Thank you. And actually, I didn't even realize until this moment, but it might be that I made that decision in part because Bob Goff donated all of his profits from this <laughs> book that he wrote um, to his favorite charity. And he does incredible, incredible charity work. So my beliefs, my philosophy about influence is that as you're going down the path of becoming a more influential person, it's your opportunity and your privilege to get to work on bigger and bigger problems and work with people who are doing more and more to solve those problems. So for me, the existential problem facing all of us in this generation is the climate crisis. So I look around and I say, what can I do to help? So I spend a good deal of my time working with climate activists and people working in sustainability, trying to help them learn more and be empowered with influence tools. And I was super fortunate to get a generous advance for this book. And I am super fortunate to have already a great life, which some of it is influence and some of it is frankly just luck, right? Like anybody who's super successful, like luck is a piece of that for sure. Um, so I already had all of my needs taken care of. And so I decided, yeah, I can give my time and I can give my expertise and I can give my love and my platform, which like right now, the first organization that I've donated the first $50,000 to uh, just last month is 350.org. They're grassroots climate activists who are very active and very successful all over the world. But also just we need to give money. Those of us who are in a position to be able to give money, especially if we're working on the climate crisis, our money is much more valuable now than it's going to be in the future, because this is the moment where we have the opportunity to make game-changing world historic shifts to steer the boat before it's too late. So we can save a lot more lives helping and investing now than we can helping and investing in the future. So one of the questions I hope people leave this conversation with is the one you just posed to yourself and it's what more can I do to help? I think if we all looked through life through that lens, uh, we, we'd be living in a much different place. And I hope moving forward, more people will start asking that. Final one before we link up uh, additional links and where everyone can pick up the book, which is influence is your superpower. I would love to know if you could do this, sit down, long form conversation, just explore any topic you would want to with someone dead or alive, just not a family or member or friend, who would you love getting to do that with? Oh my gosh. Oh, it's so fun. I think at least today, it would probably be Britt Marling, who's my favorite actress. And she's also my favorite 
director, writer. She's so creative, brilliant, weird, and has more going on in her mind as I perceive her than most of the rest of us. And she's most famous for being the star of the show, The OA, which is on Netflix. And if anyone is a sci-fi fan, or even if you're not, (laughs) highly, highly recommend. Um, So yeah, Britt Marling, I'm a huge fan. I would love to talk with you like this someday. (laughs) That's awesome. So I just want to make sure uh, all the listeners are completely aware of the book Influences Your Superpower. Anything else you want to leave them with? Um, And obviously we'll have everything linked up in terms of where they can pick it up. I just want to make sure they're able to stay connected with you. Thank you. Yeah, you can um, check out my website, zoechance.com. And also if you're an audiobook listener, like a lot of us who are obsessed with self-improvement are, I narrated the audio. It was really fun and it's available on Audible as well. Fantastic. Well, Zoe Chance, I can't thank you enough for joining us on What Got You There. Thank you so, so much, Sean. It's really been a pleasure. Take care. Got you there with Sean Delaney. Got you there. And I want to thank you for watching another powerful episode of the What Got You There podcast. We drop new episodes every single Sunday. So if you subscribe to the page, you'll be the first one to see these powerful episodes. Remember, we deconstruct world-class performers to understand their strategy, tactics, and the routines they've used to help them become world-class in what they do. So if you want to understand and then implement these into your own life, you're going to want to subscribe to the page. Remember, we also put out a weekly newsletter called Momentum Monday, which is just a quick synthesis of everything I've been reading, listening to, and watching behind the scenes. You can stay up to date and follow everything we're doing at whatgotyouthere.com. What got you there with Shonda Laney? Got you there.